Good morning. My name is Malcolm Young. Welcome to the forum. It's such a blessing to see all of you today. Um, today, as our guest, we have Joyce Maynard. Um, she is a woman who began publishing stories and magazines when she was only 13 years old. Um, she um, was, came to national attention when she published on the cover of the New York Times the story, An 18-Year-Old Looks Back on Life. I love that title. Uh, it's, it was in 1972 when she was a freshman at Yale. Since then, she's worked as a reporter and a columnist. She's written 17 books, including the novels To Die For and Labor Day, both adapted as films, and the best-selling memoir At Home in the World. Her new memoir, The Best of Us, this is it right here, um, it tells the story of her meeting and marriage to a, a man who it turned out to have pancreatic cancer. So it's a lovely love story for the first half of the book, and then the story of um, uh, coming to terms with this terrible illness in the second. Uh, and to introduce her, we have something a little bit different this morning. We have a film. So we're going to play the film first and then um, bring Joyce Maynard out. Instructions for dancing, but I, 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 I love it when you read to me and you, you can read me anything. The book of love is long and boring and written very long ago is full of flowers and heart-shaped boxes and things we're all too young to know but I And, you know, for somebody who's just spent so much time with the book, I mean, even the picture from the SF MoMA of the person, the, the man of built all, all the little wires. You could, Jim I mean, was determined. To go there, yeah. To go to SF MoMA yeah. when it opened. Yeah. And it was about two weeks before he died. Yeah, yeah. And I just think I, we were there so many times during the opening ceremonies. And, and actually, it's a very yeah. nice thing now because when I go to MoMA, there are particular artworks that I stand by and I remember standing with Jim there, yeah, yeah, um, exactly. which is not a sad thing; it's a happy thing. Right, and you don't have to think. I yeah. wonder whether he would have liked this. Yeah, no, yes, this I is do. exactly I know what all he of liked his it. favorites there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a particular sculpture in the the British sculpture room, 
Uh, some of you have probably seen it. Um, and it's made of these metal sticks. Yeah, that's what I was sticks. trying to describe, exactly. Um, and if you stand right in front of it, it looks like a man. Yeah. But as you walk around it, you just see a bunch of sticks. Right. And he walked, he probably weighed 90 pounds at this point, but he was determined to see that museum. Yeah. Uh, he was a real lover of San Francisco and a real lover of this cathedral, which is why this is such a great morning for me. Um, uh, he walked all the way around it very, very slowly. And as he walked around it, he said, he's disappearing like me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I read that last night, and I was so moved by it. Our, our children loved that sculpture. Yeah. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful place. Maybe you could describe how the two of you met, and what were your first impressions of him? Absolutely. When you, you know? I, and, I, you know, I have to sort of give a little bit of the context oh, yeah, you know, we should, before uh, yeah, we met, <laughs> that uh, we were not young. Um, I mean, I feel I'm still young, but we were not, we would, we were not viewed as young. Um, Jim and I had both um, had early marriages that had failed, um, three children each, and, and um, had both been divorced almost 25 years at the point that we met. Um, and which really, you know, those years taught us a lot yeah. of what, what did and did not matter and who we were. Um, and we had been single parents for a long time, and our children were, of course, launched into the world. And we met on Match.com. And I always like to say, I have to say, I met a lot of other people on Match.com. Yeah, so do I. Jim too. <laughs> and every one of them, no doubt, had a lesson for me. <laughs> or I for them. But, um, <clears throat> but we met on Match.com. And I always like to say that for the people who, the other, you know, 57-year-old, 59-year-old, whatever age yeah. people, um, are feeling that maybe they're too old. Um, so we met. And it was a very untypical date. You know, you, for those of you who have not had a Match.com date, more typically you say all your great, you know, accomplishments right, right, and exactly. triumphs. And we didn't do that. Yeah. We right away told some of the hardest things. Yeah. And, and I, I trusted Jim with mine and he did the same. And that pretty much set the tone for our relationship. Right, right. Yeah, that honesty with each other <clears and <clears <throat> right from the very beginning. And in fact, I'm going to dive right in and tell you. Yeah tell you what I told him that night and where I was at that night, apart from being oh, yeah, a 57-year-old right. woman. I didn't woman. tell them that. I will tell this. <laughs> okay, good. Story, and it, it, it's the part of the story that you might not be expecting to see in a book that is a, a love story about a man and a woman who meet and, and find each other and then, yeah, yeah. And, and then lose their marriage. Um, or lose each one, other. Of the, yeah. one of the partners. Um, but at the moment that I met Jim, I was six months away from the greatest failure of my life. And I will now tell you as briefly as I can, but I can't tell it too briefly. And you know, of course, yeah, what yeah. that was. Um, I raised three children. I adored being a parent. Uh, I was certainly a very imperfect parent, but an enthusiastic one. It was my favorite job I ever had. And my children were launched into the world. Yeah. I'd been a single parent for most of those years, which meant it was not easy. Single parent, raising her children as a writer. And finally, I might have seemed to have a little bit more ease and space in my life, and I just desperately missed children in yeah. my life, and yeah. raising children, and loving children, and being, of course, my children still loved me, but they weren't there. Right, and right. I made what was to many people the incomprehensible decision at the age of 55 with no partner, and you know, certainly a very uneven way of uh, supporting myself, I made the decision to adopt two older children from Ethiopia, sisters, who had lost their mother to AIDS. They were um, said to be six and nine, I think they were probably more six and 13, which is a big difference. Um, uh, not to say that the story was defined by that, but um, I, I brought them home uh, uh, as their mother. I adopted them. And within a very short period of time, probably 10 days, realized that nothing I had learned or known or thought I knew as a parent raising the children I had given birth to was going to serve me or them in a completely different experience. Children who had known more pain oh, yeah. and loss uh, um, than most of us in this room in our much longer lives. And I, I was absolutely committed to staying the course as their parent, although I think I recognized that 
for myself, I had gotten in way deeper yeah. than I understood. And that's in spite of the fact that I had taken classes and read books and done all the things that you know, one is told to do. Um, but there came a point 14 months into the experience of raising my daughters and the constant struggle when I made a choice that I would once have said was unimaginable to make. In fact, the first time it was suggested to me, I, I covered my ears uh, um, to find them the family yeah. that, that could give them what I could not. And I will say that they needed a father, they needed other children. Well, I, mean, um, I think the heart, in reading it, I mean, a, a church. Well, it's everything. I mean, I mean, to, to, it's hard enough to have teenagers <clears throat> when you've been the one who's formed them all the way up until that point. But I mean, here, here you have instant teenagers, and and they, they've come from a totally different place, and totally and so much hurt. Yeah, and, and I will I will take full responsibility yeah. for my failure and say that at the bottom, at, at the core, although all of those things, father was important, yeah. to other children was important. Um, I had not recognized that you cannot enter into an experience like that with needs of your own. And I yeah. had many. Yeah. I needed to be loved back. I needed love a lot. Yeah. And that was an unrealistic expectation of girls who had had that much loss. Um, and so I said goodbye to them. And, and I didn't just say goodbye. Right, I right. scoured the country for the family. Um, that could give them what I could not, and I found that family. Yeah, yeah. And I had said goodbye to them. I had brought them to that home, and I, and I, I left, and I knew I had to really leave their lives. Right. So that night that I met Jim on that Match.com yeah. day, and I will say, you know, this is not a story that ev everybody can understand or accept. I know that. I lost many good friends or people who I thought were good friends. Yeah, I yeah. won't judge them. They yeah. could not accept it. And I am still very criticized um, for that choice in many, in many forums. Um, I felt it was an, an essential story to tell in this book because I actually did learn that I could stay the course yeah. and love well. Right. And it was right. also an important story to tell because, you know, Malcolm, one of my jobs, one of my functions as the kind of writer I am yeah. is to talk about things people don't talk about. Right. And there are many others who have had this experience, I've, I've been, but, but don't hear about it. I've been talking to so many of my colleagues about this because <clears throat> there is a certain amount of self-revelation that happens in preaching. And there's <clears throat> so many times you think, oh my gosh, I've got to say this. Like last week of the sermon, I just did not want to say it. But there, it's in, there, there's a way in which it's given to you. You know it's going to make people unhappy. You know people are going to misunderstand it. It's hard to say that truth. And, and, and that, making people unhappy is not the worst thing. It's, right, yeah. It makes them think. Yeah, and yeah. I think... One of the things that I've done over the years is, uh, you know, put forth a story that people often, you know, say, oh, I would never do what she did. That's yeah. okay. I, I talk about, uh, in the story of Jim and me, of course, the first part is this wonderful love story. Yeah, that was great. And it's very romantic. <laughs> it is. Um, I was, <clears throat> I don't think I really understood on that wedding day that you saw in that film what marriage was, but we certainly had a great romance. Oh, yeah. And then we had a marriage. Yeah. Um, but I, I also talk about the struggles. It's, you know, the struggles of being a caregiver. Um, the struggles of totally... I was a very independent person. I'd right. been on my own for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I worked very hard, but nobody told me where right, to go, exactly. what to do, and yeah. I, and I well, could you, always... You don't even really have a boss. I mean, so you just... I had, no. You know, it's and not like suddenly... You're... I found myself, I would not have expected that I could do this, yeah. giving over my life to the needs of yeah. my partner. I, I was a selfish person. I, I really didn't, I could do that for children, but right. I didn't know about that. You know, I, it made me wonder, because, I mean, the images from the, the courtship are just so magical and so beautiful. And I, I wondered how you remembered them. Um, did you keep a journal, or did you did, did you just reconstruct? And how accurate do you think that those memories are? Very. You know? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> That's yeah. just the way it felt. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've never kept a journal, yeah. but I have been a writer. Here's an appalling number for 50. Yeah. Well, I've been publishing my work for 50 years. Right, I've been a writer right. longer. And if you read at home in the world, you'll you'll know some about why that is. But um, I know I go through life watching. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I I did keep notes during Jim's illness about you know names of drugs, oh, yeah, and right, exactly. bacterium, and procedures. Um, and Jim knew I was doing that, and Jim well, yeah, knew I would write that, this book. Exactly. But but I did not, I did not need to write down 
you know, yeah. uh, the, the things. The first date. Uh, the, no, the, or, yeah. or, you know, the, I tell the story in the book of, um, we, had, um, we had struggled so hard. Um, we got, in November of, of 2014, we got what was basically a terminal diagnosis for those so of you. So this is a, a few months after, after the wedding. Uh, 15 months after the yeah. wedding. Um, uh, pancreatic cancer is a pretty, is a, is a, is a pretty bad cancer. Um, and we were told that, that there's only one way to survive this cancer, and it is a surgery called the Whipple procedure, um, a pretty brutal, I might say barbaric surgery, um, that um, Jim almost certainly did not qualify for. Um, and even if you get the Whipple procedure, the odds are very high that the cancer will still come back. All I heard at that moment was, Whipple procedure, we're going to find someone who right, right. and And we, he underwent the toughest kind of chemotherapy and radiation, and I lived with a phone on either ear, yeah. you know, looking for, for doctors, hospitals, teams that, that might treat him, and found one in Boston. We traveled 3,000 miles to Boston, kind of, you could question this, you know, we lived in the Bay Area, there right. were two world-class facilities, but somehow in my magical thinking, I thought, if we go further, yeah. our odds are better. And we had this, we had this procedure. I would never have said we right, once. Right. I would have said he had this procedure. Yeah. But suddenly I found myself, and, and then the cancer came back. Um, and I tell the story, it's very near the end of the book. Back when we had still had more hope than we did by this point, because um, we kept on to hope a long time, yeah. right, almost to the end. I had bought us, <clears throat> or he had bought us, two tickets to see Bob Dylan at oh, the Greek yeah, Theater right. in Berkeley. And I don't need to say where here. Um, <laughs> and he'd never seen Bob Dylan, and we had this picture. By the time the concert came around, uh, which was his 64th birthday, yeah. Jim, was on, Jim was on morphine, and Jim could barely get out of bed. But he was absolutely determined to, not just to go to that concert, to take me to that concert. Yeah. And I tell the story in the book of going, oh, yeah. you know, starting oh, out just... hours early to <laughs> yeah. get there. And Jim, you know, walking so slowly from the oh, handicap yeah. parking. And when we got there, Jim actually passed out. Yeah. And I brought him, I mean, there would have been people who would have said, as with the adoption, she's a crazy woman. Uh -huh. You know, what is she doing? Taking a man, you know, at this stage right, right. to, but actually I knew there would have been worse ways to go than at a Bob Dylan concert. <laughs> and, and I took him in the Bay Area. If you ever have a medical problem at a, at a rock and roll concert in the Bay Area, it's good to know there's this group of yeah. old hippie RNs called Rock right, Medicine right. that treat you. They're used to like bad LSD yeah, trips of yeah, years exactly, past, but yeah. now it's, you know, geriatric anything, people exactly. who used to have bad it. <laughs> and so we go to the tent, and he's like lying there flat, and there's no drugs for him at this point. And he rallies yeah. for, he, he sleeps through Mavis Staples, rallies through for the concert. We're in the handicap, wrapped in blankets. All you see is his head oh, sticking yeah. out. And he's not really speaking. And I say to him several times, Jimmy, you want to go home? It's cold, even for me. Forget about yeah, for a 94 right. man. He says, no, uh. no, staying. And as we, we stay right till the end, second to last song when the nurses helped us to the car. And as we're going to the car, he hasn't spoken practically all night. He looks at me and he says, did you have a good time? <laughs> well, do I need to write that down in my yeah. journal? Uh, so, that, I mean, that I, Bob Dylan <coughs> concert, it, the mu way music informs so much of this book, there's uh, so much music in it. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just like how music is related to writing. And then also um, just that... Oh, nice uh, that, question. Yeah, yeah. I, well, G Jim was a lover of music. He was an attorney in San Francisco yeah. by day. But really, at his in his heart, he was a bass player. He was a rock and roller, <laughs> and he did play the bass very well. And he he played his bass almost to the end. There was a group of other San Francisco attorneys who were also, you know, had rock and roll dreams, and they got together and they played. Uh, the, uh, and um, we listened to a lot of music. We went to a lot of music. We never yeah. missed hardly strictly bluegrass. Right, right. The last Those time, are my favorite ones. The really. last time we went, we always ran like crazy. He was a very fast person. I was too. We wanted to take in all the music, and we yeah. I staked out blankets at all the different stages for those of you you know who haven't been, and we would just rush through the crowds to get take in as much as we could. The last October that we went, he couldn't do that anymore, yeah, yeah. and and he moved very very slowly. 
but you know we were still living which is part of the yeah. theme of this book that we were our way to face death was to embrace life for yeah. as long as we yeah, possibly could. Yeah, that's exactly could. right. In, in a way, that's I, you know, that baby boomer part. This is this is this is part of the new story. Yes. Um, what about <clears throat> literature? Do you think baby? And it was more than or? baby boomer. I don't think it was that. It was love. I mean, to me, music is a, an expression of yeah, joy is, and feel or sorrow, feeling. Right. And and we were feeling yeah. all the way through. I actually, I. For the last 16 months since Jim's death, I have done every single thing I could to, to honor that experience and express that experience. Of course, the big thing was that I wrote a book and I made this yeah. video. I made a playlist, which is on my oh, website. Great. I'll, I'll that it's on Spotify, yeah. and it is just the songs that sort of yeah. Oh, I should have I told, told me that time. You would have listened um, to it while I read. <clears throat> well, it's four and a half hours long, but. Oh. <laughs> I, I think there were a lot of songs, there's, there's, but yeah, there's a lot of I wrote too, a though. song. I did, I did everything, and I, you know, I would perform a dance. Yeah. I, I wanted to fully tell this story and honor this story. Yeah. And ultimately, um, let this move past this story, which yeah, is the right. other thing that you have to do. I, this is a book. I don't think this is a cancer memoir, and I don't think this is a, a book about about death, it's about surviving loss. Right? Yeah. It's about loss and surviving loss and, and locating the lessons of loss. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. I, you know, I, um, that's a big part of what, who I am now. I'm not the same person. I'm not, there's no thought of, and I'm sure there are so many people in this room who have known loss. You're not, you don't go back to your life yeah. as it was before. Yeah. You were changed by it. And, and, and you should be changed by right, it. Right, right. You know, if, if we experience catastrophic loss in our lives and take nothing from it, then, you know, what a waste. That right, would be. right. You know, I, one of the thoughts I had, I, I, you know, if Jim could come back for a day in his healthiness and his healthy uh, body, mm. what would you spend the day doing <clears throat> together? And oh, what my would you God. tell him about what's gone on since, he, since he, his death? Oh, my goodness. What a, what a wonderful question. Well, we'd probably take a long walk. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. We would probably take a long walk. We we hiked a lot. Yeah, yeah. And we would talk. And you know, at the end of the day, I, you know, the beginning of the book describes all of my, uh, really so many of my more romantic, my dreams that I had of, you know, what a relationship would look like were carried out. You know, we, <clears throat> we went into the city and we went out to dinner and we went dancing yeah. and we he flew to Paris and we, you know, we, d <laughs> we drove over the Golden Gate Bridge yeah. and the, you know, under the stars and, and went to Point Reyes and slept outdoors. And, and all of that was eventually stripped away. Yeah. And when all of that is stripped away, you find out all that really matters. So it would be something, it would not be some big event that we would yeah, do yeah. on that day. It would be... And what would you tell <clears> him <throat> just about what life's been like since then and how you're doing? And well, there's one piece of very hard news that yeah. <laughs> you right. wouldn't like too much. I guess everybody knows that news. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, I might try to skip over November. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um. I, 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 You'd have to tell him, I'm I afraid. Have to tell him. <laughs> we were You're always honest, honest person, with each exactly. other. We were always honest with each other. I would tell him that I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. He was worried about that. At one point he said, near the end, he said, it's not dying that I mind, it's leaving me. Yeah, yeah. So I would want him to know that I was okay, which yeah. I really am. Yeah. Yeah, in, in one place you say, you talk about the lessons that cancer teaches, but yeah. you don't really spell out what those and lessons are. And if only are. you could have them without the cancer. Right, exactly. That's what you say. Which it's is so part brilliant. of the, you know, exactly. I'd love to think if you that maybe the this lessons. book went somewhere. I mean, of course, there's the obvious, you know, you, you appreciate every day, yeah. you, you know, you appreciate, you, you, we were pretty good at that even before cancer because we'd waited a long time yeah. to find each other. Yeah. Um, I think part of it is recognizing all the things that don't matter, that aren't important. Right. Um, one of them is patience and quiet. I was a very busy person. I was always rushing and trying to just take in as much as I could. Yeah. And, and um, I didn't sit still. Um, but with a very ill person, Jim was, Jim spent, Two full months at UCSF yeah. near the end at oh, Parnassus. Yeah. He died at home, I'm, I'm very glad to say. But, and basically, I lived at that hospital, and I lived in that bed. He was yeah. skinny enough that I could lie down next to him, and I spent most of my nights there. 
And for a person like me who'd been so busy all her life, yeah. there was a huge lesson in stillness. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, one of the things that's interesting um, in here is um, just the role that Facebook and social media yes. kind of plays in our new life. And, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about just, is, is social media changing how we <clears throat> relate to each other? Is it... Is well, it, it was, it, it served a huge purpose for me. I, you know, I, the thing that I have done, Malcolm, more than longer and with more consistency than anything else yeah. in my life, including being, you know, raising my children, which I did for quite a few years, um, or being my parents' daughter right, because they died right, yeah. long ago, is writing. I've been doing this all my life. It's what I do. Yeah. And um, I think that's my phone. That's my phone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, um, and for those 19 months, I did not write. Yeah. I did not write. I didn't know that I could do that, right. not write. Um, but I missed, I, I couldn't imagine writing a novel in the middle of that. I, um, I couldn't well, imagine I I working on a book. But I had to communicate. Right. Readers have been a huge part of my yeah, life. Yeah. I, hearing back from readers, which I consider fully 50% of the experience of oh, being a writer great. is you. Yeah. Um, and connecting. So what I did was I wrote on Facebook. And I didn't just write little things like, you know, what we had for breakfast. I really... I really explored what was going on in our story. And it was, in some ways, more possible to do that with people I'd never met than with the friends who, you know, I could have picked up the phone and talked to. So for my Facebook community grew oh, hugely. Because I, yeah. I was publishing, basically, essays on Facebook right, almost right. every day. And I was hearing from, it maxed out at 5,000 people. And I was hearing from people all, all day long and all night long. There was always somebody in some time zone who yeah. was up in Australia. Um, the day Jim had that 14-hour surgery, oh, yeah. I went alone to the hospital by my choice. But Facebook friends came in all day long, yeah. and it was they said they were praying for me. That yeah. felt very good yeah. for us. Right. Um, um, and it has continued to be a very important part of my life. I don't confuse it with my publishing life. You know, I um, the book is not a collection of Facebook no, posts. No, it's I don't, not at all. I don't it doesn't really feel like that. that. Um, but <clears throat> but for those for those 19 months. I was really sustained by a community of people I'd never met. It was my church. You know? Yeah, it is. It is. That's lovely. I, 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 and and it's, um, there is a way in which we're, we can be connected to each other in a totally different way. Yes. I mean, we were talking a little bit about my son going off to college. And, yes. And yeah, we're, we're in touch in a way that I could never have been in touch with my parents. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. You know, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit more about, I mean, some of the things that were most interesting to me, just because of my, I, I'm, and there's some ways in which our lives are very similar and some ways which are were different. But I was completely wondering about just like that dating part, like you know Match.com. You know what were some of the some of the profiles that you read that were memorable? <laughs> you know what, or, what you know what was that experience almost like? Was, it, it's almost that they're not very memorable. They they all oh, that's want the a woman who they're looks not equally good in jeans and a little black dress, and they all want to walk on the beach, and they they all have a boat. They all have <laughs> I'm a boat. sorry, I don't. You know, I'm yeah. sure they're great guys, but but yeah. <clears throat> well, this is good. I mean, somebody um, watching this would be able actually, to learn. To, um, Don't put in the stuff about the boat if you're, <laughs> if you're writing. Your I tell profile. the story, you know that you, this might seem to be kind of a you know a sad book, but there's actually a, a, what now is a funny story about the other thing that had happened not long before I met Jim, which is that I had I had gone off to Italy with a man that I oh, met yes. on a Match.com date. Oh my gosh, that, and my heart so, went out to you. It was, it was so <laughs> unlike me to do yeah. this thing, but but I. I thought, you know, I've, 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 maybe I've been too serious about this. Maybe I've, my expectations have been too high. And maybe I should just try being well, a little lighter and just, like, yeah, have it, a good time. You know, and there was, was more to it, too. He invited himself. Well, he and did. you said okay. And so I, <laughs> I went on this date with a man that I can't even say I felt very great yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but, and I, and he seemed to feel great about me for some reason. He was very enthusiastic. And At that well, for point. many reasons, he was enthusiastic. <laughs> um, and then he wanted to take me out the next week. And I said, well, actually, I can't go because I'm going to Italy. I was teaching writing. I teach writing. In fact, I'll let you all know. I teach writing at my home in Lafayette yeah. and on the shores of Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. I teach mem only memoir. I really love to teach memoir. So I was teaching writing in Italy the following week. And I had this hotel room on the Mediterranean and a little village on the Amalfi Coast. And everything would have been beautiful except I was going alone. Yeah. And when I said I'm going to Italy, he said, well... Uh, why don't I come? And for about five minutes, that sounded like a kind of fun idea to, you know, go to Italy with somebody. And, you know, I, I had all the sort of 
the romantic stuff around it looked really good, going out the wonderful pasta at midnight yeah. and walking the streets of Positano, everything but the person, you know, with whom I'd be doing this. And <clears throat> so he came to Italy. And within about five minutes, he came a day after well, I was these there. These people are so much smarter than me. I didn't realize that they, they were right. I was, I was thinking, I was hopeful at first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> within, it just kept getting worse within, and worse. Uh, within two minutes of his arrival, yeah. I, but actually, while I was waiting for him to show up, I thought, I don't even remember what he looks like. <laughs> this happened. So, and then he shows up, and oh my goodness, no! How did I do this? I'd also brought a whole lot of clothes because I really. I didn't have a lot of opportunity to dress up, oh and so I brought God. all these outfits for all these romantic dinners. So I had many, many suitcases. We were going to then go to Venice afterwards. This trip got more and more elaborate. Yeah. And within three days, I had to, because I really can only be me. Yeah. I sat him down and I said, this is not working. Yeah. And he looked kind of crushed. Uh, because it was working great for him. He was going off to the bar every day and you know, drinking while I was teaching. And, uh, and As the reader, I was immensely relieved when you did this. <clears throat> and he, uh, uh, you know, there were all these wonderful classical music yeah. concerts in the evening. He was completely uninterested in yeah. them. Uh, he was kind of, you know, a piggish man, I have yeah, to say. Yeah. And that was the truth. And so then he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, you need to, he said, you mean, but like yeah. after this week, because he had a free hotel room. Right, and right. No, I said like, now you need to. Yeah, leave. I was so relieved. <laughs> but then I was left with all these dresses and high heels yeah. to haul well, around the, Italy. The, the issue is really this: three suitcases. So yes. it's it's not like you can take two of them and no. you're okay. I, you have to <clears throat> do the working in shifts, which is. And the, if, if anybody's <laughs> been to Venice, you know there aren't taxis, yeah. and uh, so you know I had this system of like carrying two and then going back for the other, yeah. and then you know, and and there was one moment. When a man called out to me, seeing me struggling up these steps in, in, in Positano alone with my suitcases, and he called out in Italian, but uh, I could understand what he was saying, where is your husband? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was calling out the same right. thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. And then there came Jim. Yeah, exactly. And you I know, called him my guard dog. Oh, yeah. I love that. You know, it's funny because I, 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 there, there, you, that's like the most striking thing about what you write is how honest you are, how you're not trying to put yourself in a flattering light. And, <laughs> and, and so I did wonder too, just I'm about, really good at that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's <laughs> frightening. Finding failures it's, is very yeah. easy for me. Yeah, I think it's frightening for all of us because like the disclosing ourselves is always a risk and, and any person can recognize that. Do you know what I mean? You know what I've learned, Malcolm, from and it, this is one of the gifts of publishing my work yeah. for as long as I have. And it's one of the things that I, I feel I impart to my writing students. The moment that I connect with a reader, the moment that you connect with a reader or a listener of your story, are not the moments when you portray yourself as this great heroic yeah. figure, this you know, uh, showing his or her best side. It's the moments when you dare to show your your weaknesses yeah, and your vulnerabilities yeah. well, that's what I was and your failures. About. Was and Jim Jim's situation? I mean, so you're writing this, and I was wondering if there are any moments where you thought, "Gosh, I wonder if I, if Jim would want me to say this. Jim wouldn't want me to say this. No, nope. you didn't have that uh, thought. Jim, I did not ever. Yeah. Um, I, 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 Jim really authorized you to do it. Jim, Jim was so many things, but one was a, a huge supporter of me as I was. Right. Me and and he celebrated that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so no, the, I, the closest I will come is telling you that Jim, as I mentioned, Jim was a really good musician and yeah, he loved yeah. rock and roll. He loved the, he loved the bass. He loved the Beatles. Yeah. And he grew up in an extremely uh, uh, repressive fundamentalist family. Yeah. He was not allowed to watch the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show in 1964. He was exactly my age and couldn't watch that because his father did not believe in rock and roll. He secretly played in a rock and roll band. He kept his bass somewhere else because the Beatles were bad. And he was finally forbidden to play. And he was allowed, there was only one place that he could play rock and roll. And he was very, very good, so he really wanted to play. And that was, I'm sure some of you remember this group, Up With People. Yeah. Kind of dreadful. Um, uh, but uh, they were... They were yeah, no, sanctioned I, right. by that world. And so he did play bass with Up With People. He was actually kind of like a big Up With People bass yeah. player. And he didn't, he told me just about everything, but the last 
news that I ever got from Jim. It took him about two years into our relationship to say that he played in Up With People. And then I thought it would be kind of an interesting idea to go on eBay and find an Up With People album for him. It was not a good idea. That that wasn't your best (laughs) gift choice. Up, up, up with people. You meet them wherever you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one of the things you write about is just some of the the upsetting things that people say inadvertently. They don't mean to um, say bad things when someone's sick. Um, but you, well, you they don't know what to they say. They don't know what to say. They don't know what to say. I, I, I'm wondering if you have any advice for us. You know, when you know, what are some of the things that that people said that helped sustain you? That that were that were were helpful for you. Well, illness you? makes people uncomfortable. It does. Death. It does. I think death is the last taboo. In fact, yeah. I I salute you all for being here because yeah. many people can't. You're right. Can't yeah. look it in the eye. We're all going to go through it, and we're probably going to lose some people very dear to us before we do. Yeah. But we don't talk about it. Um, so I think, you know, there was, I don't judge people who do this, but, you know, there was a lot, you know, it, it, um, a speedy recovery. Oh, you know, right, I heard the right. term speedy yeah. recovery. You don't have a speedy recovery. You yeah. don't even have a slow recovery with pancreatic cancer. It, it took me a while to understand this, that, you know, our idea, our Western American idea of illness is you get sick and then you, get better. Right, you go to the doctor and the doctor uh, helps and you. They and they fix it. They've got a drug for you. Um, finally, I would say, and you know, all the people I write about, uh, in fact, one time I really got mad. I, wherever I went that day, to the bank, to the grocery store, uh, what, uh, what are you doing this weekend? Have a good day. Mm-hmm. How's your day going? The one you have to answer, how's your day going? Yeah. And you have to either tell something that they really don't want to hear or lie. Mm-hmm. They're not, there's no good options. I would say the best advice is simply to acknowledge what's happening. You don't need to fix it. It cannot be fixed. Um, Just to say, this must be hard. And now, after the person dies, to not pretend that they disappeared. To say their name. To just say their name. I'm always happy when somebody just speaks of it. Right, right. That's very helpful. Um, one of the traditions we have um, at this forum is um, we have little cards. So if anyone oh, would like good. to I've been um, looking forward write to a this. question, yeah. you can write the question on your card, and um, Rebecca will collect the collect questions and bring them up. Um, one of the questions I had when I was reading this, <clears> and I, I, I was just what kind of kid <coughs> were you? What kind of child were you? Um, what did you like to read? Driven. I, mean, I was driven. <laughs> you were just like... Um, I was... Um, and I think there, there, I, there are people in this room who can probably relate who are about my same age. I was born in 1953. Yeah. I was the daughter of, well, two brilliant, talented, and deeply frustrated parents. Uh-huh. And in the case of my mother, she was a highly educated woman. She'd had a PhD from Radcliffe. Wow. And like so many wives and mothers of the 1950s, she couldn't get a job. Uh-huh. My mother sold encyclopedias door to door. Wow. in our little town in New Hampshire for a dollar an hour and tutored Latin. Yeah. And, and she put her big energies and ambitions into me. <laughs> um, I have a sister, too, and my sister also is a writer, but she kind of rejected that. She, yeah. Early on, she put a little fence over it, not happening to me. But it, um, so I was the one, and before I could even write, I gave dictation. And my mother typed up my stories and mailed them off. This is part of the story of my first memoir, At Home in the World. And... I always, I can't remember ever being so young that I didn't know that it was my responsibility to achieve the success that my mother deserved and yeah. lay it at her feet. Wow. There's a there's a, a Yiddish term for that. It's nachis. Yeah. Um, and I did. I I sold my stories to Seventeen oh, magazine, gosh, and yeah. then and then this that story with its ironic title, you know, an eighteen year old looks that, back though. on life. Um, <laughs> when I was eighteen, and. Um, and then, and I will just sort of, I won't tell the long version of this story, but because it is something that many people know about me, when that story was published, and all of my mother's dreams for me oh, and for her yeah. came true. I got all these offers to publish books, go on TV, you know, model yeah. for magazines, go on the radio, yeah. publish books was the main right, thing for right. my mother. Um, I received one other letter of a completely different nature from a man Beautifully written, funny letter, wise letter, saying, I bet you're sitting in your Yale dormitory room right now, uh, you know, getting all these offers from publishers and go to, you know, go on TV and be interviewed on the radio and model clothes for magazines and all the things that had happened. And he said, 
you're a real writer and I want to issue you words of caution. You will be exploited. This was, there was some irony in this. Yeah. And he went on to sort of offer himself as my friend and mentor and guide. He said, I know a thing or two about early success. And by the end, by the time I got to the signature, I already considered this person to be wise beyond anything I had known. Yeah, right. I had never had a religion, but really he sort of yeah. offered me this spiritual, and the signature was that of J.D. Salinger. Wow. Um, and with whom I embarked on a correspondence, quite naively believing he was my friend. He was 53, I was a very young 18. Yeah. And ultimately, within a couple of months of Basically, I can say getting letters from Holden Caulfield. That's what it felt like. Wow. I, um, I left college. I gave up my full scholarship at Yale, gave up my job at the New York Times writing, and moved in with him and tried desperately to be the person that he wanted me to be. Right, and right. I believed I would be with him forever. And when, almost exactly a year later, he sent me away. Uh, we were on a trip with his children who were just a little younger than I. Um, and he put two $50 bills in my hand and said, I want you to go back to the house, clear out your things, and disappear. And then he told me lots of ways that I had failed as a human being. Things that if any man said to them those things to me now, I would definitely think less of the man. Right. But an 18-year-old girl mm. thinks less of herself. Um, and that story was one that I felt I could not tell for 25 years. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, then my daughter, and I, that was out of an absolute sense that the important person to protect was Salinger, so much more important than I. This, if this has a familiar ring at this particular moment of women, okay. you know, sort of protecting the secrets of powerful men, um, uh, I did not ever speak of him for 25 years, not even to the man I married the first time around. It was known that I'd been with him, because right. it was a pretty dramatic thing when I withdrew from Yale. But, um, and then my daughter, Audrey, turned 18 the age that I had been in my life. Wow. And I suddenly saw that experience differently. And that's when I wrote it Home in the World, which is sometimes called the book about Salinger. It's uh, actually not the book about Salinger. Yeah, it's yeah. the book about me exactly. and my mother and, right. and becoming a writer and finding my voice, daring to tell the truth. And just like you said, this, this moment in time, I mean, you were between your mother's generation and whatever it is now. Yes. And in that transition time, I mean, it wasn't as easy for women to be writers. And, and and so it's about that too. I and think. and to speak and to speak uh, their truth. Yeah. And it's yeah. again, it's why I teach memoir because I so believe in in nobody should have to give women permission, give anybody permission to tell their story. But many people feel that they don't have permission to tell their story. And I I wish I could say that those times were totally behind us. I don't believe that they are. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree. Let's hear what people These are have to great. Say. I mean, could okay. you talk more about teaching memoir and what makes oh, it special for you? Good, yes. Well, just what I said that, um, you know, I write fiction. I've, I've, I've published nine novels, uh, but I don't teach fiction writing. I want to help. I know what it meant to me to tell my story. Yeah. And that's whether you publish it, whether you get on the bestseller list or it sits in your drawer, you have told the truth. You, yeah. you will not go to your deathbed not having. Spoken, explored, yeah. you spoken. And sometimes that's not just saying what happened, but making sense of what happened, yeah. which is a big part of what I, I like to help people do. So I, once a year, for the last 18 years, on the shores of a, the most beautiful lake I've ever seen in Guatemala, a very yeah. unlikely place, I host a writing workshop. Oh, that's great. All of this is on my website. And then in my home in Lafayette, I, in fact, there's one of my writing and students here too. today. Okay. Um, uh, I teach workshops for people of whatever level, I'm often very happy when it's somebody just starting out because they don't have any bad habits. Yeah. And I also honor my mother, who was really the most brilliant teacher of writing oh, I ever had. So here's a great question. Um, you talked about the needs of being loved and accepted by your adopted daughters. What advice would you give to stepmothers or uh, stepmother to, to be for having the needs um, and accepted by their partner's teenage children? Oh, boy. What a good question. That's I mean, first of all, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not in the advice-giving business. Yeah. I think that would be a presumptuous thing. So I'll just speak for myself because I was a stepmother, and I was a stepmother who entered into a, what, if you read the book, you'll know was a painful situation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Jim did not have an easy relationship with his three children. And the one thing I can say is that I knew I was not going to be anybody's, their, their mother. Yeah. I could, the best that I could do would be to be a friend and to love their father and to support their father and be open to 
knowing them. Um, but I can't speak to living with younger stepchildren because I never did it. And maybe one of the reasons that I didn't make a relationship all those years was that it is so hard to put two families together. Right, right. I, I wrote a novel about it one time, and in the novel it didn't work very well. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just say I, I, I honor your pain because I think it is a very hard role. And a lot depends on who the, the other parent is back home, the real right, parent, the birth right. parent of those children, whether that parent is going to give the children permission to open their hearts to you. Yeah. This is a question I had for later, but this is good for now, too. What does the next chapter of life look for you, Joyce? What ideas are you cultivating? Oh, well, I thought that I finally knew where I was. I, for yeah. the first time in, in 25 years when Jim and I got together, I thought I knew my future. Yeah. Not all of it, but, and then I so didn't. And now I know almost nothing. Yeah. I really know almost nothing. And I embraced that as, a, as an adventure. I might go back to college. Right. I actually I think love, about I that. Think that'd be great. Um, I I know that I cannot. I I I'm, I I will be writing a novel. I'm thinking about what that novel will be, and I. I think actually, a memoir of you going back to college would be really interesting. I I, I have to go back to college first. There's about three <laughs> years I have to attend to first, right. Malcolm. So it wouldn't be an easy thing to do. And I would really like to go to Yale if I go to college. Yeah. Well, you, but, you could um, take classes with my son. I could do that. Um, he really and, likes his American and, philosophy And if class. I did, I wouldn't be taking like English classes. Yeah. I'd, I'd want to study art and music and biology and you know all the things that I didn't study and that I w wouldn't go on to. Acting, you know, drama. I would, yes, I could play the mother music. in every play at Yale. <laughs> <laughs> the grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> Two-part question. One, what does your, your young voice as a writer say to your mature one? Mm. And number two is... As one who can easily dis in, um, oh, these are great questions. I know. As one who can gush inspired writing, um, a tip, please, on how to edit without killing the inspiration. Oh well, uh, all I can say about that tip is take a workshop with me. I don't think I can reduce <laughs> it. Um, I do say. Well, I will. I'll say one thing that my mother always said. I know Dorothy, you will remember this one. My mother used to say, "My mother was a child of the depression." And she used to say, write as if every word cost a nickel. Uh. This was back in the 50s, she said that. So now I, I say $5. Um, I, I'm a huge believer yeah, in economy. Too, um, the, what my young self tells to my old self, it's, it's funny, I think more of my old self looking back at my young self yeah. and saying, don't drop out of Yale. <laughs> don't go off with that man. But I can't even, you know. Uh, yeah. What my young self says, you know what my young self says to me? That I actually, I am, this is true for all of us, whatever age. We are changed by life, but we are always our young self. Yeah, we are yeah. always who we are. I can, I'm, you know, I have the advantage or curse of having many of my young thoughts committed indelibly oh, to yeah, print. Right, of course. So we I can, can read the book that I published that I wrote while I was with Salinger uh, that I published when I was 19 and read that I said uh, that I would live on a farm in New Hampshire, which I did, and I wanted to have three children and adopt two orphans. I said wow, that wow. in 1972. Wow. Um, but more than that even, I was still the same person about loving to, to draw, loving to have adventures, yeah. wanting to travel, wanting to see other cultures, wanting to speak in the language of the place where I went, uh, loving babies, um, uh, um, being, um, uh, being almost endlessly curious, but also recognizing that I didn't totally fit in, that the, that I hadn't, someone hadn't given me the rule book somewhere right, along the right. line, and I, I've always missed out on it, so some basic things I didn't know. Um, my old self is still my young self. Yeah. We are just the people we are. Our faces may look different, but we, we, are, we are who we were yeah, born to be. Right. I just spent the weekend with my granddaughter. I have, a, I have an eight-month-old granddaughter now, and I, I feel that I know the person she will be. Yeah. She doesn't speak yet, but I know many things about her after the weekend. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love that. You seem so alive. Why, oh my gosh, will... Oh. Okay, you seem so alive. <laughs> I don't know if you could... Why were you alone for 25 years? Oh, I would have edited that if I'd known it. <laughs> Here, let me see the rest of it. <laughs> Your choice? <laughs> oh. 
Not necessarily. <laughs> uh, I, it also I, says you have an attractive I, heart, too, right? I have an attractive heart. I, <laughs> I think that's what it says. Oh, that's very sweet. <laughs> Maybe that's just me um, adding that. <laughs> I, I think, truthfully, one of the things that I, I, I don't waste a lot of time on regret, but I regret how long I spent being, uh, being bitter and angry about the marriage that oh, didn't yeah, work out. Yeah. And I often see this in other people who get a divorce. You know, I couldn't let go of a lot of anger. And it took me a, I, I now can sort of look back on the person I was. I always thought that I wanted, I was really somebody who always wanted a partner and always wanted to be in love and wanted to remarry. <clears throat> but I look back on that woman now and I can see she wasn't ready for that. Yeah. She was still dealing with the, the, the marriage that had failed. Yeah, that's funny. You feel that even in the book. I mean, because the, yeah. the, 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 it took old, me way too long. That person who had that resentment just kind of faded out. Yeah, I'm fine with my children's father now. We, yeah. we danced at our son's wedding. Jim couldn't go, he was yeah, too sick. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, so that was one of the reasons. And, you know, maybe I wasn't perfect. Is that possible? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here's one that's a tough one. I experienced the loss of my dad not long, not a long time ago. What helped you out of the great loss? Do you pray? Do you trust life? Oh. Um, I, I didn't grow up in any formal religious tradition, as you know, yeah. Malcolm, although I, I came from two. My mother was Jewish, and my father came from a Christian fundamentalist background, uh, and I was both and neither. Mm. Of course, I did what everybody does in those situations, became a Unitarian. But oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I love you. It wasn't a lot of prayer going on. <laughs> but I do, I do pray. Yeah. I have my own prayers that I make, and I talk, you know, when I, 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 I walk, and I talk to God, to yeah. Jim, to my mother, to many people, um, or to myself. Yeah. Um, the loss of your father... Um, one of the things that I can say, because I lost both of my, wherever the person is, I wish I could be looking at you. Yeah. Um, I lost both of my parents when I was quite young. I was 27 when I lost my dad and 35 when I lost my mother. And I don't think that I, I was so busy at the time. I had young children. I was working. I did not give myself space to honor that loss. And, and, and almost 30 years after the death of my mother, I, I, I feel that I, it, I still suffer the effects of not having given myself that time. So that would be the first thing, to do whatever it is you need to do. I was supremely lucky that I had the tools to tell this story and, and share this story. And I, you know, I would really recommend for anybody who has a big loss, you know, go on a book tour and talk about it every single night for seven weeks. But short of that, I do actually believe that writing is a wonderful tool, which is why I so believe in memoir. Um, and not writing about the death which is where a lot of people start when they come to my workshop. They talk about the death of the person and the funeral of the person. Talk about the life of the person. Bring that person back. I will say that the, the, the year that I spent writing this book after Jim's death, and I started writing it right. the night he died, powerful, yeah, which was... would be sort of shocking to some people. Yeah. It was the only thing I could do. Open my laptop in the middle of the night, one hour after I had awakened and seen that he was dying. The first page and a half of this book is what I wrote that night. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to capture that experience. And as long as I was writing it, Jim was with me. It was a very hard book to end. But I, <clears throat> whatever form that takes, if you're a painter, if you're a writer, if you're a musician, if you do not have any formal discipline in the arts, I think you, you know, you build something, you make a garden, you make something. I'm a huge believer of taking the stuff of loss and making something of it. Yeah. <clears throat> Beautiful. Um, do you have a relationship with Jim's children? I'll be very honest. No. Yeah, yeah. It was their choice, and it was very sad. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and if you read the book, you, get a sense you won't why. see any big stories on that, but I think you'll sort of feel. Yeah, I, feel I, I totally do from, from reading that. How did you come to terms with your grief over the loss of Jim? How long did it take? So maybe that's a little bit like the... You, it's an ongoing process. It doesn't end. It's, I, I like to say I keep grief in one pocket and joy in another, yeah. and the joy wins. Um, but I carry it forward. I also know that my whole life cannot be a memorial to my husband who is gone, yeah. and that he would want me to be fully celebrating my life. In many ways, I celebrate it more now because I, I feel he didn't get to have these years. Yeah. I will, it's my birthday next month, and that, at that moment, I will, 
I will turn 64, which will be the oldest he ever got to be. He died. Right. He died four days after his 64th birthday. And I will. I, I know I will feel from that moment on. I'm having days he didn't get to have. We have the AIDS quilts up in the um, north in the um, um, <coughs> in the main nave upstairs. So. You know, the names project, quilt after quilt after quilt. And that's my overwhelming feeling. And you look at somebody and think, gosh, that person died at the age of 32. And yes. They never knew what it was like to be 40. Yeah. They never knew what it was like to be 50. Um, and, and you're right. I can imagine you feeling uh, that uh, way. Uh, how are we for time about... Uh, We're good. We're yeah, so okay. sweet to... Um, don't. I, I, uh, okay, you're in charge. Yeah, yeah. You See, don't have to worry I, about that. Do you wonder why I didn't make a relationship? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It, I, I think it's I, so sweet. I, th I was in charge of everything Joyce, for I think so long. I, I love that. I just, it was I, actually I, one of the great. I, I, lo I loved it that there was like somebody. I used to. I'm, a, I'm not a good driver, and I really <laughs> loved it. Jim was a very good driver. Yeah. I loved being the passenger. Then there came a day when I was the driver. Yeah, again, yeah. You know, but but I, I loved not being in charge. Of well, that's what we appreciate about you, Joyce. You're like you want you want to be part of a team, and you're ready to help out any way you can. Yeah. We love that. Okay, so the next is not a direct question. Hmm. Can Joyce talk a little about her Canada connection? Oh, well, my parents were both Canadian. Yeah. And um, my, my mother's parents emigrated from Russia. They, they came from the Ukraine. And my father's parents were, they had been missionaries in the Salvation Army, and they, they found it too liberal. Uh, so they... they <laughs> They were part of a group called the Plymouth Brethren, oh, and yeah, the Plymouth right, Brethren right. Uh, went to Canada, and so that's what my father uh, uh, grew up in India, and then in British Columbia, um, where he was a modern artist and a very fine artist. Oh, yeah. you, you can still see his work if you Google his name. Um, he was not a very acknowledged painter, but he was discovered at the end of his life. Um, and my mother and my sister is Canadian. Yeah, yeah. Um, I. In one episode of House, a TV show, um, Dr. House says, quote, you can't die with dignity, you can only live with it. What uh, is your response to this? Uh, well, I don't know. D Dr. House has never been my ultimate <laughs> oracle. I, <laughs> um, I think Jim did die with dignity. I, he yeah. lived with dignity for sure. But... Um, uh, and the dignity didn't take the form. You know, he was a very, as you might have been able to tell, he was a very dapper man. He was a very elegant man. He, you know, he he was a San Francisco attorney, yeah, and oh, he yeah. kind of dressed the part. And he, um, and all of that went away. And you know, his, I mean, he was still a handsome man at the very end of his life. But you know, he was just, as he said, you know, he was just down to nothing. Um, the dignity was within. Yeah. Uh, but yes, his his dignity was. The great gift of his of his willingness to share his death so totally with me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah beautiful. You know, um, a lot of what uh, questions I had when I was reading this was just what is it like to 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 date people and to see people and that that life that you had just before Jim, um, it, you know, just the, the Match dot com people. And I just wondered if you have any advice for people who may have not been on a date for thirty years mm -hmm. and, and now find themselves yeah. in that. In that to open your heart yeah. um, and to have as few preconceptions of, you know, I, I mean, I had this idea of what, I actually tell the story in the book, I'm looking at the clock and I want to make sure, but um, uh, I, I told Jim, actually, I knew that Jim was a really wonderful man, but I did say on a second date, I'm so sorry, but I, I don't see a future for us because you're, this is really embarrassing that I said this, uh, you're too short. I had this idea. He was two inches taller than me, mind right. you, but I had this idea that I needed to be this tall, burly man. That right, was my right. romantic picture. And I know it had to do with strong. And I thought strong took the form of big. Right. And Jim, what could he say? He couldn't argue. You know, yeah. he, he was a good really, litigator. I'm two but, inches taller um, than I am. <laughs> but then he did, this, he did this brilliant thing. The next date we had, we still had another date. And we're sitting out on my deck, and it's Fleet Week in San Francisco, and the blue angels are flying over the house, you know, in the way that they do. And I look up at the sky, and I say, boy, those blue angels, I just find them so sexy. And Jim said very quietly, he was a very low-key guy, very differently, and he puts his cigar out, and he said, you know, to be a blue angel, you can't be taller than five foot eight. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if this is true, but it had the effect. <laughs> we'll have to look it up on Google. 
Well, it's been such a pleasure. Can to I read have my? Today. Oh yes, yes, please do. Yeah. Um, and then I'll do the the um, well, final announcement. Okay, wonderful. I, yeah. I I wanted to share with you just a page of this book. Um, here's what happens when you love someone a great deal, and he gets sick, and then he dies. All those months you spent taking care of him, it was almost as if the two of you were one person. He was the one with cancer, but the pain consumed you both. You were off in the North Atlantic somewhere, stranded on an iceberg, and though it was brutally cold on that place, in that place, and every single thing about being there was hard, you were together on your iceberg. There was hardly one thing that took place that you did not share. Then your iceberg broke in two. You floated off in one direction, he in another. And though the place you ended up is a warmer one, with sailboats passing by, their bright flags fluttering in the breeze, and people waving and calling out to you, sunshine again, and maybe even porpoises circling with their smiling faces, your fellow traveler has disappeared. His iceberg melted away with him on it. New things are happening now that you experience and he does not. Some wonderful, some awful. What would Jim have thought about the election of Donald Trump? <laughs> that would have killed him, I said to a friend the morning after, if he wasn't already dead. Maybe this is what people mean when they say, life goes on. This is the good news and the terrible. It began that summer, this process of drifting out to sea. It doesn't mean you cease loving the person who left. Everything that you had and everything that happened remains with you. Life doesn't stop is all. Not yet, anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a joy. So t this morning we have um, Alan Jones will be preaching mm. at the 11 o'clock service. Next week, Alan Jones will be the host of the forum, and he'll be interviewing Mat Matthew Schilbach, the new um, head of the opera. It should be an amazing conversation. I am going to Parents Weekend, so I'm going to miss it, but I wish so badly that I could be here. Um, if you are able to, please do support the forum. There's a little glass box where you can make a donation. Um, and I want to just say one more time, thank you so much to, to Joyce for being here today. And I'll be signing books oh, back perfect. there. Oh, perfect. Great, yeah. great, great. great.